Welcome in, everybody, to Fantasy Pros. This is the Fantasy Football Podcast. It is me, Joey P, Joe P. Zapia. And today, oh, what a show we've got for you. It's mock draft season for the rookies in the NFL. Our first NFL mock of the year is upon us. Derek Brown, D-Bro, the king of bros, is here with us. Easy e Andrew Erickson, and our new best friend, too, who I've never done a show together with, so I'm very excited. Uh, Paul is going to join us. Paul Perichisi, Perichisi is how I got to say it. I got, I got to, I've been working on my Italian all week, trying to make sure that this Italian doesn't screw up uh, the name. Paul, did I do okay? Is it Perichisi? Am I, am I saying it properly? Are you happy with my Italian pronunciation from one paisan to another? Absolutely. You nailed it. Excited to be here with you guys to, uh, you know, combines in the rear view mirror trades happening every day. It seems like on quarterback front. So it's going to be fun to do this mock draft with you guys and talk some prospects. You can follow Paulie on the Twitter machine at Paulie23NY and check out all of his work at Saturday to Sunday on the football podcast. Now, what else you guys got going on at Saturday to Sunday football.com? Because I know you guys do a lot of work, especially this time of year, Paul. Yeah, so we have our Saturday Sunday premium notebooks, and for $9.99, you get access to all our premium content. You get three different notebooks. You get our scouting notebook, which has over like 100 uh, deep detailed profiles on the upcoming rookies, only offensive based. You get our rankings notebook, which has all our rankings for the draft tiers, Devi dynasty, rookie rankings and overall positional dynasty rankings. And then in April, you get the draft projections notebook, which has tabs for every position, offense and defense snapshot of who they are, about 400 players in there. Uh, and if you were following me this week on Twitter, I was posting all my thoughts, basically that create that notebook for the combine. And then, uh, projecting how I expect it to go off the board based on what I'm hearing. And we've had really good success trying to project who goes in round one, the first three rounds, and then uh, all seven rounds, try to make a projection on the 256 players that actually get picked that night. Ah, yes. And uh, so it all begins. And it's not like it hasn't been a big, busy 48 hours for us, too, with all the quarterback movement and things going on in the NFL. We did an emergency podcast just last night, Andrew Erickson and I. But uh, another... A uh, bit of housekeeping we've got to do up at the top, boys, because there's been a little uh, discord going on, so to speak. Not in our discord, ironically, but in our Slack. Some of our fellow league mates and teammates here at Fantasy Pros felt that we did not give them enough love uh, <laughs> regarding the flag football game that we played last week at our company retreat. So I just think it's very important if we're going to continue to have a good working relationship with everybody that we acknowledge uh, the MVP of the flag football tournament, the East versus West versus North versus South contest that we had, which is our video producer, our quarterback, our leader of the East team, Chris Lynn. So everybody stand up and applaud Chris. Chris was the man, uh, a big body Ben Roethlisberger type quarterback too. I think people were kind of intimidated by Chris's size uh, and, and throwing the football the way he did. Also shout out to the rest of our East team too, especially Mike Mayer, who also had a bit of a complex because we didn't mention him on the last show and all of his interceptions that he had. Everybody's uh, everybody's ego, very delicate here. So I just want to make sure that we're giving props to everybody. You know, I wouldn't even mention that the guy who, you know, with basically a, a cracked finger here, as I'm showing everybody here on the YouTube channel, caught two touchdowns of the championship game. I didn't even acknowledge that. Nobody else did. But I want to make sure that Mayer got his props, that Chris got his props too. Uh, Andrew? Uh, we got to give props to the rest of the East team. Who else uh, out there we want to give some props to? Man, more props. I mean, you know, to our competitors who who did the mm. best they could to try to stop us. Uh, it just didn't work. But hey, you know, everyone deserves a pat on the back. Sportsmanship. Here we go. Uh, so yeah, there, <laughs> there, there you go. Yeah, and people were upset, Derek, that, that you got any airtime at all because you <laughs> lost in the championship game. So they had to deal with that blowback as well. Hey, I did what I had to do, okay? But if we're giving shout-outs here, yeah, we got to sit here and give uh, a little bit of credence to Freeman, who left, I think, maybe a half of a pound of flesh on the field, uh, literally, with all the strawberries and bleeding he was doing on the field from all these diving catches and cornerback plays. So um, it definitely got to give a shout-out there. And, I mean, look, uh, the flag football gets real, and it gets real fast, okay? I know I was real sore after that game. I don't know about anybody else, but uh, the age definitely came through after uh, – after playing at least a little bit of time. Yeah, I, I will say this. Uh, huge props to our new boss, uh, head of content here, Matthew Friedman. There's nothing more intimidating than the new boss who's bleeding and typing at the same time after the flag <laughs> football game on his laptop. That's a very in intimidating guy right there that you want to make sure you don't screw up at work 
uh, because uh, ooh, don't cross that dude. But also shout out to Justin Logan, Carrie, our coach of the East team too, because, you know, uh, again, it was a group effort, but my goodness, we were just casually talking about it and people were up in arms. So I hope now, again, the team that won with no substitutes in the heat in the Death Valley uh, game at Death Valley Field, basically. I just want to make sure that that gets out there. Now we could talk about the football that matters maybe slightly less, which is the NFL, just slightly less than whatever we got going on at Fantasy Pros. So let's do that here, and let's talk uh, first about, obviously right now, uh, this is the time to be following us with all the news going on here at Fantasy Pros in the last few days. Hopefully you follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok at Fantasy Pros, but if you don't, subscribe to all of our YouTube channels that we got right now because we got betting pros content coming up for NCAA. We've got obviously the NFL draft coming up that live streams right around the corner. We want you to be part of our family here. And that means subscribing to all of our YouTube channels. Again, that's the MLB channel, the NFL channel that we've got to obviously our regular fantasy pros channel and our betting pros. So don't forget about Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at fantasy pros too, because when this news breaks, we've got you covered and we've had you covered here these last few days when this massive news has broken. So make sure you check all that again, youtube.com slash fantasy pros too, for all the pods and all the videos and all the great content we've got going. So speaking of content, if you want to watch this podcast, go to fantasypros.com. Obviously, go check out our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash fantasy pros, and subscribe and click that notifications bell. And then you can watch the draft unfold here. And since Paul is our guest, we're giving him the first pick here. The Jacksonville Jaguars are officially now on the clock. So, Paul, tell me, what do you want to do with this first overall pick? The entire board is yours. Where's Jacksonville going to go? Yeah, so I mean, it's a, it's a untypical year, right? No elite quarterbacks at the top. So ideally, I think Jacksonville, since they have one, would have liked to look to trade out. But I don't think that's realistic this year. So I think I think they're going to go with a guy to try to help out Trevor Lawrence and solidify that O-line a little bit more. So I'm taking offensive lineman from, N- from NC State, Iki Akanwu. I like the size and frame, the athleticism, the movement skills and quickness. Very good, the great play strength, power, toughness. He's got good length. And I think this is key to year one, especially with the news yesterday that they franchise said Cam Robinson. He's versatile to play guard or tackle. I think obviously long term, you're going to invest in the first pick in the draft as a tackle. But I do think the Cam Robinson thing was a, a maybe they try to trade him after they tag him. We started out a couple of years ago with D Ford in Kansas City. So I do think there's a little bit of they have the cap space to franchise tag him. Jacksonville really doesn't have enough good players to be letting somebody go without getting something back. So that's kind of what I feel with the Cam Robinson move was. I think they're still going to maybe long-term want to build that offensive lineup. I don't know if Robinson's going to be there for the long haul. I know they drafted Walker Little last year as well. But I think Ikanwu has the highest upside of anybody in this offensive line class. And I think that's who the pick's going to be to try to fortify the line in front of Trevor Lawrence, give him the best chance to succeed. I agree with you, Paul. If you make the big investment in the quarterback, you do everything you can to protect that investment. And Ikki Aquando goes a long way. The offensive tackle from NC State. Now, Andrew Erickson, pre-show, we were talking about, you know, maybe Hutchinson going first and what you thought about that. I know you've got a new mock coming out on fantasypros.com. Actually, it might even be out already by the time we're recording this podcast. But now you are up with the Detroit Lions. So is it just obvious here where you're going with that dude that you thought might go number one? Yeah, I think it's obvious for me here with Aiden Hutchinson from Michigan. You look at the Detroit Lions, only the Atlanta Falcons were worse in terms of pressure rate last season. They need to find a way to get to the opposing quarterback. When you look at Hutchinson and what he did in 2021, PFF defensive grade 94.5 is the highest among any edge defender since Chase Young, who we all know went very, very high and has had a pretty productive NFL career so far. So I think Hutchinson, especially after how well he tested in the short area quickness drills at the combine, his three cone, 6.73, 100th percentile, his 20 yard shuttle, 4.15, 94th percentile. I think that he is a slam dunk pick here for the Detroit Lions at number two. All right, there you go, Aiden Hutchinson, certainly a fantastic football player. Uh, seems like a 100% quality person too. somebody you want in your locker room, somebody you want to kind of build around and somebody that I think could help change that culture that Dan Campbell is trying to turn over in Detroit this last year. And I think he actually did a pretty good job of it. That team really competed. And guys like Aiden Hodginson with that high motor, I think go a very long way, which now puts the Houston Texans on the clock here. And their needs are everything. It's everything. It's completely (laughs) wide open for you, Derek Brown. You can rebuild this franchise however you want. But what's great is you've still got 
another player here that many people thought offensive lineman, you know, Evan Neal might be the number one overall pick. He's fallen now. Now he's available here at number three. You've got safety. You got obviously quarterback could be an issue here. So you tell me here, where would you go if you're the Houston Texans? I think there's two names that stick out here. Um, Kyle Hamilton being the safety out of Notre Dame makes a lot of sense, but I'm going to go with Evan Neal out of Alabama, uh, top tackle on my board. Um, as a guy that's really well-rounded, 650 pass blocking snaps, only two sacks and eight hurries. And people could say, well, but you've got Larry Tunsil at left tackle. He's under contract for the next two seasons. Evan Neal is versatile, man. Like he played left tackle, right tackle, a little bit of left guard at Alabama. I think that they're just going to slot him in at right tackle. And basically Tunsil can play left. Um, and you're trying to build the foundation for this team. And really, your cornerstone positions are left tackle, really hard to find, as well as trying to find pass rush. So I think we're going to start with the the trenches and go with Evan Neal. All right, Evan Neal, a player who obviously in terms of the uh, freakish athleticism and size, another guy, and, and I'm with you, Derek. I think you just take the best overall talent on the board when you need so much, right? I mean, that's what it feels like, doesn't it, D-Bro, that you know, yeah. when you need so much, just get the guy that you can lock in who's going to be a franchise player. Am I right? Agree. And then honestly, as much as I like Hamilton, top five feels really high um, just for mm-hmm. a safety, even if he's like game changing, amazing. And he I mean, he's a physical specimen, but still going top five at the safety position. It's still a little bit rich for me. All right. Let's go over to the fourth pick here. The New York Jets are now on the clock. Certainly they have a, a fair amount of needs too. this is still a very young team. And Robert Sala did a very good job last year of trying to you know, start to build up the, this team is very similar to the Detroit Lions trying to change the culture. And unfortunately, or maybe fortunately they're back at the top of the draft yet again, this year with the four picks. So Paul, you are on the clock for the New York jets. Which way you want to go here with this pick? So I'm going to go to the secondary, but you guys were talking about Hamilton. It's not going to be Hamilton. I'm actually going to go for the first cornerback and that's going to be sauce Gardner out of Cincinnati, a really impressive combine performance. He ran a 4.41, but I like the size and frame. He's got the overall athletic package you want, especially for a taller corner. He's got closing bursts. He's got recovery speed, long speed. He's got good play strength and length. He uses his hands really well. He's got press cover skills. And he loves the ball skills. And he just he oozes that confidence. He's the kind of guy that I think could be a true shutdown corner. And I think he's the type of guy that they can build that defense around, especially in the secondary. And I just think, as, uh, as uh, we were just discussing, the safety to me a little too rich maybe in the top four top five i like hamilton's game a lot he didn't run as fast as i would have wanted him to but i still think he warrants going pretty early but i think gardner at that position with the ability to potentially be a shutdown corner uh i slightly value him a little bit more than hamilton so i think gardner would be the pick well paul that makes a lot of sense too because this modern day nfl is all about stopping the passing game and if you have that shutdown corner that's just huge for a defense it allows obviously you know, a little bit more time to get to the quarterback. And it feels like the, those lockdown corners are few and far between. So if you can get one, you think Gardner can be that kind of guy, obviously. Yeah, I do. I And once by a time, there might have been another cornerback who will probably come up somewhat soon. But <laughs> Some I'm guy thinking, named <laughs> Revis, I'm pretty sure it was his name, if memory uh, serves. I'm just, I, I think Gardner could be that guy that he's kind of separated himself now. I think it's the clear mm-hmm. cornerback one in this class. And he solidified that with that 4 4 one You know, the long speed was maybe the only question mark people had on him. But they, the cover skills, the ball skills, and apparently, you know, hit the intangible stuff that obviously we don't really have access to. But, you know, we go by the inside reports that are out there, you know, or to roof for this kid. All right, so Ahmad Sauce Gardner, again, great nickname. See, that's a nickname. Sauce is a good nickname. This is what I like. I don't like these lazy nicknames where they just shorten (laughs) people's names. I like names like Sauce. That's what I'm talking about. All right, now, Andrew Erickson, you've got the fifth pick here. You are up for the New York Giants. They've got a lot of needs, and, you know, uh, again, you can go a couple different ways. They certainly could use some help at linebacker. They could certainly use some help on the edge. Certainly a good draft for that, maybe offensive lineman but which way would you go if you had this pick here for the giants with number five overall in the draft i mean i I would have loved to get some big blue sauce for the new york giants but unfortunately (laughs) i've been sniped by paul great pick by him so i'm gonna make sure i stay ahead of the curve because i know that the carolina panthers are breathing down my neck and they want an offensive lineman really bad so i'm gonna try to beat him to the punch here with trials cross from mississippi state i think that's really important that the Giants protect Daniel Jones. Like if they're ever going to see what he could potentially become, they need to get him some protection up front. 
I think Charles Cross is a locked and loaded franchise left tackle. You have Nate Solder, who's not going to be returning. Will Hernandez. They just have a lot of turnover at the offensive line, and it's just been terrible the last two years. It's been really hard to evaluate Daniel Jones when he has no time to throw the football. So you look at Charles Cross, some of his best games came against some of the top SEC uh, teams, Alabama, LSU, Texas A&M, and Auburn. He combined to allow just four pressures total in those four games. So I think that he is locked and loaded to start at left tackle for the New York Giants. And Solder, unfortunately, was getting up there in age anyway, too. So getting younger on the line, always a good thing. So we'll see which quarterback he's protecting. We'll see if my conspiracy theory of uh, <laughs> Mitchell Trubisky comes through from December. We shall find out. Who knows? Could be any minute now. Anything could happen in the NFL, the way things have gone the last few days. So the Giants get the last offensive tackle on the board here that we like in that top three, top four group. Uh, that puts the Carolina Panthers and Derek Brown on the clock for the next pick here. So could go QB. We all know that Matty Rule does like his QBs. He likes to pick a new one every year. So is this another year, another quarterback? Or are we going in a different direction, Derek? I could. Um, I hate the fact that Erickson just sniped me on the offensive line. <laughs> but I think that the offensive line needs are big. And I think there's a guy that could be rising up the boards. I'm going to stay with the offensive line, and people could be surprised. But, man, if you look at what, what he did at the Senior Bowl and as well as the Combine – I'm going to put Trevor Penning up here. Uh, the needs at the offensive line position are real for the Giants. I think the Penning is a guy that could be a big riser the closer that we get to the NFL draft. Um, and maybe, honestly, I'm just reeling because I got sniped so freaking hard right here by Erickson. <laughs> but I think that the <laughs> offensive line is a big concern for Carolina. And I think if um, we're getting some rumors and stuff like that, maybe we get some clarity on Deshaun Watson later this week. Um, and Carolina goes that route at the quarterback position, but give me the O line here. Give me pinning. All right. So if you don't play in IDP li leagues like I do, I know so far you're listening to this and you're rolling your eyes. You're going offensive linemen, edge rushers, cornerbacks. Uh, what what are we doing here? It's supposed to be fantasy, right? But this is what this draft is this year. It's offensive linemen, and it's superbly talented in terms of defense, which last year it really wasn't. It was Micah Parsons, a few other talented corners, and and really not too much else that really got us all excited about in the first round, especially. So uh, this is a different kind of draft, but I think I'm going to drive home this point to our audience, which is these offensive linemen are going to make huge impacts, not just for the quarterbacks, but potentially for the running backs as well. And the wide receivers, you know, more time in the pocket, more time to throw the football. That's a good thing for your fantasy team. So pay attention to these teams that do take offensive linemen. Now we know uh, the Carolina Panthers need a little bit more help than that, but we'll get to them obviously as we continue to do longer mocks into the second round and whatnot. So Carolina Panthers take Trevor Penning from Northern Iowa. That puts Pauly back on the clock here with a pick from the Giants. Uh, this pick they got here from Chicago. So where do the Giants go with their second pick in the first seven? Well, with some O-line needs fulfilled by the Charles Cross pick, I'm going to go to the defensive side of the ball there. And there's two great edge options and, I don't think one of them anybody expected to be there at seven too long ago. And then a new guy who has entered into the mix. And I'm actually going to pivot to, to the guy who maybe was arguably the biggest combine performance and most impressive I've ever seen. And that's Trayvon Walker out of Georgia. Nice. This is a guy who ran a 4.51 at 270 pounds. This is the definition of a physical freak show. Great size frame, great length. The athletic package is amazing. He's got the power and toughness and hand usage. He was an elite, elite run stopper at Georgia. The physicality, the biggest question mark him was the pass rush skills. And I think we started to see with all these guys at the, at the combine from Georgia that they were really asked to play a certain role in that Georgia defense. And it was unbelievable, you know, carried them right to the national title game and championship. But I think there's a lot more upside and potential with Trayvon Walker to develop into an elite pass rusher as well. And I think you saw the fluidity and movement skills in, in a lot of the on-field drills at the combine. And I think he's skyrocketing up boards. I'm not even sure when, when April rolls around, if he's even available at seven, it seems like he's now very much in the mix to be defensive end, edge, whatever you want to call him, number two. And there was even whispers from a lot of reputable draft guys who, who came out with mocks this week that actually – put him ahead of Hutchinson, which I think was crazy and wild. But I think that's just the buzz right now that's going on with Trayvon Walker. Uh, he's two for me. 
So I'm glad that he went in these first seven picks because this is a phenomenal talent. Trayvon Walker, if you watch him play at Georgia, was absolutely just a monster there. You talk about size, you talk about good footwork, you talk about everything that you want, right? And I know it's tough sometimes to evaluate these guys when you're watching them play on this great team on a great defense, right? Because they're all, they're all great. So who's making who great? Trayvon Walker, he is making everyone better around him. I can guarantee you when you watch that kid play. So it's a great pickup here. And I like how you and Erickson work together here, Paul. This is really good. You and Erickson for the Giants co-managing. This is very <laughs> nice here. I like how this worked out here. So the New York Giants take Trayvon Walker. That's a steal at the seventh pick. That goes to Andrew Erickson now for the Atlanta Falcons with a whole lot of needs here, Andrew. So where are you going, offensive side of the ball or defensive? Yeah, the, the lack of pass rush for the Atlanta mm -hmm. Falcons has basically become a punchline at this point. They just have never been able to generate any type of pressure, you know, not just last year where they ranked dead last in the NFL in pressure rate, but, you know, the previous years. Their defense has never been able to figure it out since their Super Bowl run. So for me, I'm going to go with the best edge rusher available here, and it's Kayvon Thibodeau, who, you know, a couple months ago, you know, he was the guy that was, oh, he's one-on-one -on -one locked and loaded. Like, this is going to be the guy, and now he's fallen – you know, whether it's because of off-field issues, whether it's because of, you know, the way that he, you know, carries himself, the way that he, you know, likes to play chess, whatever. He's falling in drafts. And the Falcons <laughs> are just running up to the podium because they're so excited to get this uber-talented player. 48 pressures at 11 games in his junior season. 4.4 per game that ranked 10th among the 2020 edge class. I know he also dealt with, like, an injury as well this past season. It just doesn't really get, seem to – it's not really talked about with him. I know it's made for a lot of other players, but not necessarily with Thibodeau because of the way that he kind of carries himself based on his persona. So I think that the Falcons are ecstatic about this pick, and I think it's going to immediately help them get that pass rush up to substandard. Andrew, earlier in the week we talked about the downside of Thibodeau and the – recap show that we were doing to the combine this reeks of atlanta to me this pick i mean this is complete boomer bust which is i feel kind of what they've been in the draft especially on defense they draft guys and they, they have high ceilings unfortunately they really can't ever seem to reach them i hope for their sake if they draft Thibodeau that he becomes that guy but i still have serious doubts i like a job more personally but who cares what i like i care about what Derek brown likes for the seahawks uh because they've got a pick here from the denver broncos at number nine I've been saying it, and I'm going to stay on this, that I think Malik Willis goes top 10 in the NFL draft, and now we see the move with Russell Wilson going to mile high. I'm going to go with Malik Willis to Seattle here. And with Drew Locke, I mean, it, at least it, – so if Willis enters camp and stuff like that, maybe he doesn't look like he's ready. They can ease him in. We know that Pete Carroll wants to run the ball, run the ball, run the ball, run the ball. So, obviously, this gives them outs to either start lock or go with the run-balanced offense to ease Willis in. But, yeah, I, I think Malik Willis is heading to Seattle. Now, I got a question for you, Derek. I, I know everybody, you know, thinks of the energy level of Pete Carroll, you know, and he's the oldest coach in the NFL, though. Do you think that he wants a project quarterback at this point in his career? Or would he take the safer kind of Kenny Pickett? You think still Malik Willis, even though he might have a little bit more uh, projectability necessarily than maybe a little bit more polish and ready for the NFL? I think they can go with Willis because they don't have to eat, uh, push him in uh, with uh, Drew Locke coming over to Seattle. The other thing yeah. that I think that, and we're not projecting trades and things of that nature, I think that they're quietly a good landing spot for Deshaun Watson. So we easily mm -hmm. could see them move for a quarterback and get that veteran in there, like you're talking about for Carroll. Uh, but it, if we're staying here, we're not talking about trades and such. I think Malik Willis is the uh, the player to go with. Because they could easily just, I mean, not the exact same offense they ran with Russell Wilson, but using Malik Willis's legs, obviously operating with the run game and leaning on the ground game, both with Willis and Carson uh, in tandem, I think that could be a really good formula to soften the blow uh, as far as like jumping to NFL competition for Willis. All right, let's go back to the New York Jets. Paul, you're back on the clock here. This pick comes over from Seattle, but it's the Jets now. So, again, still a whole bunch of needs already in this draft. The New York Jets have selected Sauce Gardner, so you got your cornerback. So where do you go next, Paul? Yeah, I think ideally they would like to have upgraded the offensive line, but with four tackles already going off the board here, don't really see pushing one up the board. So they got to give Zach Wilson a chance. They got to surround him with more weapons, and that's what I'm going to do here. We're going to take the first wide receiver off the board, and that's going to be Garrett Wilson out of Ohio State. To me, I've been saying it a Saturday, Sunday for a couple of years now, and my co-host Macaracho as well, that we didn't get the Calvin Ridley clone. I mean, 
maybe hopefully not off the field, but on the football field after everything mm-hmm. yesterday that Brett, Brett broke. But Garrett Wilson tested even better at the combine in terms of his pure speed than I thought he was. I thought he was going to be more like Calvin Ridley, 4-4-2 to 4-4-5 range. Tested in the high four threes, actually faster than his teammate, Chris Olave. So he's got the athletic package. But for him, his ball skills, his body control, his ability to go up and get it, even for a thinner guy, I think it's fantastic. And I think he's one of the best pure route runners in the class in terms of his getting in and out of breaks, getting you know his releases, his footwork. He can win all three levels of the field. Jets need playmakers. I think having him with Elijah Moore would start to give Jets some weapons that Zach Wilson could hopefully try to uh, continue his development to be a franchise quarterback. All right, there you have it. So Garrett Wilson, wide receiver from Ohio State going to the Jets. That closes out the top 10. Just to recap for everybody, the Jacksonville Jaguars take offensive lineman Iki Aquanu. Then the Detroit Lions took Aiden Hutchinson. Houston Texans selected Evan Neal falling to third. Then the Jets took Sauce Gardner, the cornerback out of Cincinnati. The Giants then, with one of their two picks in the first round here, takes Charles Cross, offensive tackle from Mississippi State. The Carolina Panthers selected Trevor Penning, Offensive tackle from Northern Iowa. A little run there, three out of those four picks. Then with the seventh pick, the Giants back again. Take Trayvon Walker, edge rusher from Georgia. The Atlanta Falcons select Kayvon Thibodeau, edge rusher from Oregon. The Seattle Seahawks with Malik Willis, quarterback from Liberty. And then Garrett Wilson, Ohio State wide receiver to the Jets. That's our top 10, which brings us to number 11, the Washington Commanders, who seems like they've got their quarterback, and it's Carson Wentz ending up back in the NFC East. So, uh, Andrew Erickson, what comes next for the Commanders? We're going to stop the fall for Kyle Hamilton, safety from Notre Dame. When you look at the football team and what was the biggest issue they ran into last year was their secondary and their defense. You know, mm-hmm. their pass rush was there for the most part, but they were just, you know, a huge liability in the back end, getting ripped apart. You know, they were the team to, to target for fantasy. He's like, oh, who's playing Washington this week? Oh, that's the quarterback you want to start. You want to stream those guys. And I think they need to improve. Now, they have invested a lot into the defense. You know, they signed William Jackson. So I don't think they necessarily go corner here. You know, cornerbacks when they first go to new teams sometimes they're shaky in their first seasons getting adjusted to the system they drafted Jamin Davis as a linebacker last year in the first round so I think safety is really where I think they want to go Bobby McCain was pretty good last year for them but he's going to be a free agent so they have a need for it and it's also you know the best player available in my opinion that's left on the board here so you look at a guy like Kyle Hamilton, six foot four, 220 pounds. I know that the four, five, nine, 40 yard dash time has soured people on him. But I mean, again, he's six foot four and 220 pounds. Like running a four, five, nine is more than fine for a safety where you're not even care. Like, why does he need to be running at max speed? You know, he's, he has long arms. He can make turnovers. That's a big part of the defense is creating turnovers. And he was really great in the jumping drills for at the NFL combine. So Kyle Hamilton is my pick here for the nation's capital and the commander, the first pick for the commanders. Ah, nice. I like the trivia bit there. Well done. Well done, Erickson. All right. (laughs) Number 12, the Minnesota Vikings are up on the clock and boy, they need a whole bunch of help here on the defensive side. I hope that's where you're going, Derek. And I hope it's the guy I'm crossing my fingers, at least the ones that are still working properly after our football game. I'm crossing my fingers that you pick my dude here. Let's see where you go. So uh, it, Kyle Hamilton was going to be my pick, but again, Andrew snipes me. Um, he was not going to – I was either going to stop the fall, but Erickson took care of that. I am going to go with the corner position. Could go linebacker uh, with Devin Lloyd, um, considering Anthony Barr, Nick Vigil are both uh, free agents. Uh, but I, I'm going to lean with the corner position, and I'm not going to go with the name that a lot of people think that I'm probably going to go with as far as with Derek Stingley. Um, I'm going with Trent McDuffie here, uh, considering I think that he's a really good fit for what they're doing in Minnesota as far as their defensive scheme. Good zone corner, really sure tackler, and Minnesota needs that. I mean, they were middle of the pack in missed tackles last year. The Vikings ran zone coverage on 54 to 57% of their snaps for their outside corners. So I think that he's a fit. I think it's going to surprise people that he goes over Stingley, but I'm hoping that Stingley falls a little bit farther considering his man coverage skills in this mock draft. Now in the next mock draft, I promise you, Derek, I will let you go ahead of Andrew so you can start sniping him and give it back to him a little bit. I know you're not happy and we're not even halfway through here. So Trent McDuffie, cornerback out of Washington, goes to the Minnesota Vikings. That puts Paul back on the clock at number 13 for the Cleveland Browns. 
So I'm going to go to the defensive side, and I'm going to take edge rusher, defensive end, George Karloftis out of Purdue. Six foot four, 275 pounds. He, did, he chose not to run the 40, but his jump showed a lot more athleticism and explosiveness than I even thought because I thought he had good athleticism. Those jumps would even be, you know, show that he has more than that. But I really like his just his play strength, his toughness and physicality. He uses his hands tremendously. He's a great power rusher. So obviously they have Miles Garrett. They have that off the end, the bench. Karloftis gives him a little bit of a different look. And I think he might even have more athleticism than I gave him credit for, whether he was hiding his 40 time or not. But the jumps were really impressive. The on the field drills were really impressive. And it wasn't that long ago. Karloftis was in a lot of like top 10, top 12 early mocks, like during the college football season. I thought that may have been a little bit too rich, but I think with the combine performance, with his on-field production and just his overall package, I think this is a good spot for Karloftis to add to that defensive end edge group there for Cleveland. And Karloftis came to the game of football late, too, in life, too. So he doesn't necessarily have the same mileage of youth football on him and some other things. So interesting guy, interesting story. Uh, but I can't get anybody to draft my guy, Ajabu. I don't know what's going on here. Uh, we're up to 14 here, Baltimore Ravens. Andrew, is my guy finally going to go here in the top 14, or are you going a different route? No, I'm going to. I'm your I'm your hero, Joe. I'm, I'm going to come save hero, you. Andrew. I'm going with David Ajabo from Snipe Michigan. Me again. Edge edge rusher and i'm going to reunite him with his defensive coordinator for michigan mike mcdonald who is now the defensive coordinator for the baltimore ravens so you have this super raw prospect with the jabo who basically wasn't even playing on run defensive snaps like they didn't ask him to try to stop the run you know again similar to Karloftis, you know pretty new to the game of football really hasn't played it mm -hmm. that much so putting him in a situation where he is familiar with the coaching staff he's going to be familiar with how they're operating calling plays and he's also going to be reunited with Adoe Adafe Oe you know someone that he played in high school with you know hmm. so again I think that they have a chance to form a nice duo between those two players. And you look at just the Ravens current defensive line, the setup, you know, they have a lot of guys that are leaving Clays Campbell and Justin Houston right. are both free agents. So they have, they need to inject some youth into the defensive line. I think Ajabo is kind of the guy that you definitely want. I think he has a lot of upside. There's some boom potential to him, but I mean, the freakish athleticism, his four, five, five, 40 yard dash, 96 percentile. I mean, giddy up. All right, giddy up there. Get on the horse. You got the Philadelphia Eagles up next. So, Derek, uh, you continue to be stuck in the middle with Erickson here, uh, no matter what happens to you. Uh, one of my favorite songs from the late 70s. Uh, so tell me right now, the Philadelphia Eagles have back-to-back -back picks. You get to make the first one. Paul makes the second one here. So where do you want to start? So I was looking at Ojabo. I think that, like, edge is a need. Um, but considering, I think right now, and when we're recording this, tra Jason Kelsey's uh status is still up in the air i'm going to go with the top center and a need could be a need for the eagles coming up here i'm gonna go with tyler lindenbaum um and protecting jalen hurts up front um again as you're listening to this this could change if we get more news and stuff and kelsey goes back to philly but uh right now i'm going to address the offensive line i love this pick uh, another great football player you know you could see it too in the combine too does everything right all those little intangibles when you watch him play this year for iowa and iowa you know that offensive line ran so well uh, they did such a good job uh for that team so a uh, very very uh, look i think this is with all the information you've been given here currently this is an outstanding pick Derek brown so don't let andrew erickson get in your head shake it off man you could <laughs> it's gonna be fine we got a lot of picks left on the board including another one from the eagles so the eagles take uh linderbaum at 15 which means 16 you got a shot here. So where do you go for this second pick for the Eagles, Paul? So I love the Linderbaum pick, and it's also a very safe pick because while he's got extreme upside, I don't see a scenario where he's not a Pro Bowl caliber center. I just think he's one of the safest picks in the draft. And when you have three picks, you have a little bit of – you can take some chances. You can make – you know, you can, you can say, okay, we're going to swing for defenses here. And at this point, I'm taking Derek Stingley Jr. to cornerback out of LSU. Pure talent alone, he might be just as good, if not better, than Sauce Gardner. Obviously, if you could base it off the 2019 film, he might be the best defensive prospect in this whole entire draft class. So, obviously, the last two years have not gone as he had hoped or anybody, you know, on, you know, Derek Stingley in terms of like his agents, something like that wanted it to go. But I think the upside here to get a potential true shutdown corner, and when you have three picks, 
He's got great to elite level athleticism. Hopefully we get a chance to see some type of pro day before the NFL draft, but he's got closing bursts. He's got movement skills. He can change direction. He's got quick twitch. Uh, he can play zone, but I think he's best suited for man. So I just like his total package here. And cornerback is a, a need that I think uh, the Eagles have. They need to upgrade a lot of areas, but Stinglish is too good of a talent at 16. I'm not sure he even falls that far, but at this, at this point, I'm going to, I'm going to pick him up and uh, you know, shoot for defenses on that second first rounder. And you and Derek Brown have collectively upset all of the fans of the Eagles because you didn't take a wide receiver and that's all they want. All they want is a, another wide receiver. <laughs> There's you another pick coming. Don't you worry. Uh, well, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, they've got a million picks here. So I mean, certainly I agree so far, but you can hear already the screams in South Philadelphia of what are you doing? Why don't you take a wide receiver yet? What the hell's going on here? All right, let's go to the Los Angeles Chargers. Andrew Erickson. They just uh, inked an extension with, uh, a wide receiver, Mike Williams. So they've got him and Keenan Allen. Offense looks pretty good. So where do you want to go with this pick? You want to go on the line or do you want to go maybe potentially on the defensive side of the ball? No, I, I want more offense, honestly. Uh, I want you more do. firepower for Justin Herbert. I will not be swayed to draft the defensive tackle to stop the quote unquote poor run game or poor run defense from the Chargers because they just let teams run on them. Not falling for that. I'm going Jamison Williams here from Alabama. Uh, Whoa, the, the Chargers. Woo. The Chargers need to do whatever they can to surround Justin Herbert with as many weapons as possible because, look, Russell Wilson just landed in the division. Boom. That's another team you need to win against in shootouts. You got to be Patrick Mahomes. Like, you got to score points to win in the NFL, and that's what they need to do with Justin Herbert. So I know that they inked up, you know, Michael Williams long term, but that doesn't mean that you stop adding weapons. And I think Jamison Williams, you look at his profile as someone that can take the top off the ball as a speed threat. They don't really have that in LA. That's not Mike Williams. That's not Keenan Allen. Like those guys are more possession receivers. Obviously big Mike can win downfield, but he's not separating downfield. Like he makes contested catches and he's good in the red zone. Keenan Allen, you know, super savvy in the slot. Now you have Jameson Williams thrown into the mix. Oh my God. With Justin Herbert and his cannon arm, like sign me up. And I think the thing that works best about it too is, you know, depending on when Jameson Williams finally recovers from his ACL injury, they don't necessarily need to hurry him up to get him up to speed. They have Josh Palmer. They have some other guys. They have Jalen Guyton. So they can get by during the start of the season if James Williams is kind of going along a little bit slowly. They don't need to rush him back. But when, you know, the division is on the line and they're going into the playoffs, they have this guy at full strength. And that's going to be something that the other AFC West teams are going to have to deal with. So give me James Williams. You just strapped a rocket ship to his ADP if this happens. I can tell you that right now. Uh, and I'm here for it because, you know, I love Jameson Williams. I mean, the dude is just unbelievable. Big play after big play. Uh, this is great. I love it. I did not expect this. In the words of Jason Bateman from Dodgeball, I'm shocked. I'll tell you what, Cotton, I'm all <laughs> over the place right now. So, Derek Brown, I don't think that was the snipe. I don't think you are going to take Jameson Williams, but maybe I'm wrong. You're up next with the pick for the New Orleans Saints at number 18. Where are you going? So I think a lot of people could believe that they're going to go with the quarterback, and it's possible. I really think that they're probably either going to re-sign Winston or take another route at the quarterback position. I am going to go with wide receiver here. Um, I was considering Jamison Williams, not going to lie, or Garrett Wilson going off the board to the Jets. Both guys that I'm looking at, I don't think that the Saints were envisioning that this guy was going to be on the board. And But looking at a guy that, yes, there's some – the expectations at the Combine were ridiculous – and he's disappointed a lot of people, I think they consider and draft the heir apparent to Michael Thomas, and that's Traylon Burks. Uh, give me him going to New Orleans. Um, I think that regardless of what they do at the quarterback position, they need pass catchers. Marquez Callaway, regardless of preseason hype last year, is not that kind of guy you want to be tying as your wide receiver one for an NFL offense. Yeah, give me Burks here. I like the Burks pick, uh, honestly. And and this is another guy, too, where I think you look at the game footage. And this is where the combine sometimes gets a little out of hand, too. I mean, it, it maybe didn't live up to the expectations, but maybe the expectations were set a little high. Go back and look at the game film. Game film is there for Traylon Burks. This guy is a matchup nightmare for cornerback. So uh, they get their wide receiver. Do you think that Michael Thomas stays with the Saints here, or do you think he gets moved on from? I think they stay with him, at least for this season. Now, after that, it's debatable. But then again, you're not throwing Traylon Burks with Michael Thomas there into that number one starting role. So I think it's right. it's a combination of a few different things. But I think the Saints will be sprinting to the podium if 
him, or you could even make a case for Drake London, but I think that Burks is probably the better fit here. That's funny because I I think you're a London guy if memory serves. So I was kind of, I, like I, I thought that's the route you were going. So, so what ended up making you go Burks over London here was just the, the, the makeup of the organization here in terms of what they have. I think the run after catch ability and their ability to flex him into the slot and stuff, considering the type of role that they've used Michael Thomas. And I understand Sean Payton's not there anymore. You still have Pete Carmichael at the controls at the offensive uh, system. And I think that if we're looking at who could, uh, because a lot of the Burks things too have been talked about his route running, his ability to separate and stuff. You stick him in the slot and you put him on nickel corners and stuff like that, or you put him on linebackers it is going to help his transition to the NFL as well. So I think it's just a fantastic fit overall. All right. Stop me. If you heard this before the Philadelphia Eagles are up in the first round, uh, pick number 19 overall, Paul, you get to pick for the Eagles again. Lucky you, where are you going this time? I'm going to the wide receivers and Traylon Burks was going to be my pick here. So I, I feel the sniping now uh, in this draft because I just thought he fit well. So I'm down to two wide receivers, and that's either Drake London or Chris Olave, the, the, the last two guys that I think will go round one. And I just can't see the Olave pick paired with Devonta Smith. So for me, I'm going Drake London out of USC. I think he complements a little bit better uh, Devonta Smith. I also think Jalen Hurts isn't a great vertical thrower. And Chris Olave, while he's a very good route runner, he can intermediate stuff, I also think – He's a guy who can take the, the top off the defenses, and I'm not sure that's Jalen Hurts' calling card. But Drake London, great size, good frame. I think the athleticism was only average. If he was healthy enough to perform at the combine, I think that would have left a little bit to be desired, similar to Traylon Burks. But the body control, the ball skills, the ability to high point, uh, he's got good footwork for a big man. He actually did a lot of yak, but more with his play strength and just quick feet than like the agility stuff. But this is a guy who – his performance this past year when he was healthy was unbelievable. So I think there's a lot you could do with him. You know, some people see, I see part Brandon Marshall, part Mike Evans. When I see Drake London, uh, I'm not as high on Drake London as some people. He's my wide receiver for in this class. I like Olave a little bit more, but I think for the Eagles and what they have on the roster and if they're trying to project to make Jalen Hurts a franchise quarterback, I think Drake London fills a bigger need than maybe Chris Olave. Well, he made the Eagles fans happy now. So now they're okay with you. They, they've come back around. They've calmed down. They had a couple of picks in between to yell and scream and say awful things on Twitter. Now it's okay. Now you're back in the good graces. It's fine. This is what it's like to be Howie Roseman. This is what happens. You know, I mean, they didn't take a linebacker, so I'm sure they'll complain about this. All right. Now the Pittsburgh Steelers are up next with the 20th pick. And the last time, oh, back many, many years ago in the 80s where the Pittsburgh Steelers had a chance to take a quarterback from Pitt, it was Dan Marino. They passed. And uh, that did not work out very well. Now, I'm not saying Kenny Pickett is Dan Marino, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, Andrew Erickson, as of right now, on the 9th of March, there is an opening for the job. Is Kenny Pickett the guy to fill it, or are you going a different route here? I'm going a different route than than Kenny Pickett. I think that, you know, all the, you know, the desire for these quarterbacks on the free agent market or these veteran quarterbacks is kind of telling us what the NFL thinks about this class. It's just mm -hmm. they're not very high on it, and that's why people are – going Gaga over, you know, trading for Carson Wentz. And, you know, Jimmy Garoppolo is trending on Twitter because that's the next guy that's going to land on a new team. So I don't think that the Pittsburgh are going to go quarterback here. Um, I'm not, I don't think they're going to go offensive line here either. You know, look at Kevin Colbert and just his historical track record. He's just never invested in high-end draft capital um, at the offensive line position. So something they also need to fix is their secondary because right now, Cor or excuse me, Cameron Sutton is the only starting, starting cornerback under contract for next season. You know, Akilah Witherspoon's a free agent. Joe Hayden's a free agent. So I think they go cornerback here. I'm going to go with Clemson corner Andrew Booth. Uh, I think that he can slide in opposite Sutton from day one. And they just really need to shore up the secondary a little bit more. It was, again, they had so many problems last year with the offensive line and in the run defense. It kind of distracted the fact that their secondary was also really, really bad. So I think that Andrew Booth is the pick here. All right, Love so recapping pick. here, the Washington Commanders at 11 took Kyle Hamilton, the safety from Notre Dame. Minnesota Vikings at 12 took Trent McDuffie, the cornerback from Washington. Then the Cleveland Browns next took George Karloftis, edge rusher from Purdue. David Ajabo goes to the Baltimore Ravens, edge rusher from Michigan. Then at 15 and 16, the Eagles back-to-back -back take center Tyler Linderbaum. Uh, and then cornerback Derek Stingley. Then Jamison Williams to the Chargers at 17, wide receiver from Alabama. Then Traylon Burks continues the run here for the Saints. 
of wide receivers from Arkansas. Burks goes to the Saints at 18. Then at 19, Drake London, wide receiver, USC to the Eagles. And then Andrew Erickson just took uh, for the Pittsburgh Steelers, Andrew Booth, cornerback of Clemson. Now, Derek Brown, you have my New England Patriots. So I just want to tell you as a Patriots fan, I'm going to scream two words at you, linebacker. <laughs> Now, I, I'd like to scream a couple other words. Where I'm yeah, going. I hope you take the one that I like because I know uh, the consensus says one thing. I know where my heart tells me I want to go down south for this pick, but I want to know what you pick instead. Tell me who is going to be the pick for the New England Patriots at 21. Uh, so there's two linebackers that are on the board still. We have Devin mm-hmm. Lloyd at, out of Utah, and we have Nicobe Dean. I am going to go with Nicobe Dean here. I think that he's a better fit for what the Patriots do. Um, if he happens to fall down the board, which he didn't, I think Derek Stanley would have been a fantastic fit here in New England as well. But you have Dante Hightower, Jamie Collins, and Jawan Bentley are all free agents. I think Dean's going to be the pick, and I think he's going to be a fantastic fit for what New England wants to do with that defense. Uh, I love it. That's exactly the right answer. Good job, Derek Brown. You're going to get a, a nice, you know, nice ice cream sundae after the show is over. Chris, by five my linebacker. Here's my five. There we go. Ow, don't hurt me with my finger. It's all still jacked. Yeah, you're tasting hill finger over there. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I high five you uh, very, very Gamer softly. Gamer show up a go time, D bro. This hand <laughs> caught uh, not one, but two touchdowns in that game. And this is why you watch on the YouTube so you can see it. Of course. But yeah, you got you small hands. You, you were rocking the P- Kenny Pickett gloves during the game. I was rocking the Kenny Pickett gloves. That's right. Me and my eight and a half inch hands. But, you know, once again, I think that this finger might, might be in good shape, but this finger's got a ring on it. So. You know, that's that's where we're going. All right, let's go to another pick here on the board. Nicobe Dean is now off of it. Number 22, the Las Vegas Raiders are up next. Your new head coach, uh, where are you going here with this pick, Paul? So I'm going to add some playmaking ability. Obviously, Henry Ruggs no longer there. Going to replace him with Chris Olave, wide receiver out of Ohio State. Love this speed, the total overall athletic package, the acceleration, the burst, the separation quickness. I've been saying it's Saturday Sunday. I think he's part Terry McLaurin because his fluidity and his movement skills and his route running. But also, I think he has that second gear, like almost like a Will Fuller type in terms of getting vertically down the field. I know some people are worried about like at the catch point. I, I just think he's he's going to create enough space that we don't have to worry about the catch point. That's not who he is. That's not how he wins. He's a separator. He can win on all three levels of the field. I personally like him a little bit more th- than Drake London in my wide receiver ranks. You know, but I think for Philadelphia, London made sense. And I think for Vegas, this would be the type of guy that exactly what they need to compliment Hunter Renfro, you know, Waller and what what they want to do there. They need a guy like Olave to be able to stretch defenses and win at all three levels. Are you confident with the new coach, Josh McDaniels, that you'll get um, him, you know, Derek Carr throwing the football downfield again? Because you saw a little bit more of that recently. You know, that was something that a few years ago was a tenuous situation. Uh, Are you confident that Carr is confident and that the new head coach is going to let him throw the ball downfield. You know, I, I'm not sure because I don't think that's where Carr succeeds. So I think, you know, McDaniels, right. I think is one of the better play callers that'll put him in a position to be successful. So I do think we might see a little bit less of Olave winning vertically early on, almost like we didn't see Jalen Waddle win much vertically last year. And we know he could, right. That was his, one of his calling right. cards. So I think it's going to be a little bit different for Olave but I do think he's got that route running and that Terry McLaurin type ability that he can win at all three levels. And I think eventually when Vegas moves on from Derek Carr, they, if, if they get a quarterback that can push the ball vertically down the field, we'll see more of that vertical stuff from Olave. I'm just not sure, you know, McDaniels is going to let him unleash it, especially you know, with New England, with Garoppolo, with Brady at the back end of Brady's New England tenure. It was a lot of move the chains, keep it moving. I think that's probably how he envisions Derek Carr, especially, you know, as they're, you know, adapted and put in installing a new system all right number 23 the arizona cardinals up next andrew erickson you are on the clock man i can't believe you guys are i can't believe this guy's still on the board uh it's jordan davis defensive tackle from georgia superman himself an avenger i can't believe he's available he's gonna be at the draft you know he's gonna have to save the world somewhere else but you look at the arizona cardinals they have some question marks on the defensive line overall Corey peters is a free agent same thing with chandler jones so they have question marks about stopping the run they have question marks about generating a pass rush and now jordan davis didn't really do a lot of pass rushing at georgia but i mean clearly the athleticism the upside is there for him to be more than a russ a run stuffer we all saw it four seven eight forty time 341 pounds it's the best weight adjusted time at the nfl combine ever 
Like, the guy is a freak of nature. His speed score was basically almost the same as DK Metcalf's, who we also just glorify as this just insane size speed specimen. So I'm going with the speed demon himself, Jordan Davis, to the Arizona Cardinals. And we already know he looks good in red. So we're okay. All right, Jordan Davis to the Arizona Cardinals defensive tackle from Georgia. That puts the Dallas Cowboys up at 24. A lot of tempting things you could do here, Derek Brown, including maybe giving Micah Parsons a friend at his position. I don't know if you want to go that route. Uh, certainly looking, there's another edge rusher out there available too, but what do you think they're going to do here? I think they're going to give him a friend to rush the quarterback. Uh, I thought I was going to get sniped again by Erickson, the way that he led into that, but <laughs> I am happily going to, and the Cowboys would be doing this as well. They're going to sprint to the podium and scream Jermaine Johnson's name. I think if you wanted to go a different route with this, that's fine. I think it's really picking your flavor based off of edge and stuff. But Jermaine Johnson falling down the board, I think that he probably goes off the board in the NFL draft a little bit higher than this. But give me him to the Cowboys. I mean, considering the fact that Randy Gregory, Carlos Watkins, Dorrance Armstrong are all free agents, uh, he, good fit. Good fit for this team. All right, so Jermaine Johnson goes to the Cowboys, edge rusher from Florida State. The Buffalo Bills up for the number 25 pick. So where are you going here for this one, Paul? You know, Bills, you know, not a lot of needs that I think are really pressing. So I think they have the ability to maybe go best player available. And, you know, Jermaine Johnson pick, you know, like that, he's a guy who probably is going to go 10, 12 picks earlier than, than just was taken. And I think another guy that could go significantly earlier is Devin Lloyd out of – uh, the linebacker out of Utah. So that's going to be my pick here. I like his all-around game. I know people are a little disappointed uh, with that time at the combine in terms of his 40 time, but I think he's the type of guy that his play speed is so much faster than maybe what his time speed was. And, you know, on the broadcast the other day, they were comparing him to a guy like Darius Leonard who didn't test really well at the combine. To me, he's very versatile. You could do a lot of different things with him, kind of like how Dallas used Mike Parsons last year. You want to rush the, the passer, Lloyd could do that. You want to cover, you, he can cover. He can play in space. He's good against the run. Great play strength, physicality, toughness. I think on the field, he shows a lot of good athleticism and movement skills laterally going north-south. So I think they just take the best player available here, a guy like Lloyd, who probably should have been off the board a few picks earlier, and I think could have been the pick instead of N'Kobe Dean, also for New England. So he's the pick here for Buffalo. All right, Andrew, you're up next, number 26 for the Tennessee Titans. Yeah, so the Tennessee Titans decided to not address the wide receiver position last year in the draft and instead went through free agency, got Julio Jones. Uh, I would say that the results were, I mean, they were the number one seed in the AFC, but I think that we all know that the results were less than optimal. So they're going to go wide receiver here, and I think this might surprise some people, but I'm going to go with Christian Watson uh, from North Dakota State. Um, you look at the Titans, and people might look at this as a reach, but, I mean, when I'm looking at the wide receivers available, Watson is right up there with who's left on the board, and the Titans don't pick again till 90. So they don't really have a lot to play with unless they trade down to look at some of these wide receivers. So if they have to make this pick, I think they do go with a receiver. I think Watson is just someone that has just been skyrocketing up the boards. He impressed at the Senior Bowl. And then when you look at what he did during the Combine, 38 and a half vertical, 84th percentile, Broad jump was really great at the 98th percentile, 4 3 6 40 yard dash. And I mean, this guy is six foot four. Like, this, he has so much upside attached to his profile. If he had gone to a power five school, he would be in the conversation with those other wide receivers we talked about. But because he went to a small school where, remind you, John Robinson from the Tennessee Titans, GM, oh, he, he knows a thing or two about taking a small school receiver high in the draft when he drafted Corey Davis, uh, fifth overall. So, Christian Watson's the pick. We are 26 picks in and only one quarterback has gone. Tampa Bay Buccaneers are up next. Now, they did draft a quarterback in Kyle Trask last year, but they're up now at the number 27 pick. I'm just curious, Derek, where do you think they're going to go with this one? They could go the quarterback route. I don't think that Bruce Arians wants anything to do with a rookie quarterback. Um, so, actually, I'm going to – I mean, all these quarterbacks keep falling down the board. I think it's realistic <laughs> that it happens in the NFL draft. So I am, again, going to sidestep very quickly the quarterback position here, and I'm going to go with guard Kenyon Green. Considering Ali Marpet just retired, Ryan Jensen is a free agent, Aaron Stinney is also a free agent, I think Green is going to offer them versatility, is going to protect whatever quarterback I think they trade for in the veteran route. Uh, with Kenyon Green, I mean, he played right guard, left guard, left tackle at Texas A&M, 
explosive, good pop. I think he's going to be a, a really solid player for them. Um, so, yeah, give me green. Good pick and good reasoning. Well done, my friend. Well done. Green Bay Packers up at 28. I assume they want to take another quarterback, right, Paul? That's <laughs> that's what they like to do? Or, or no, we want to do something else here. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe another, another failed wide receiver. I don't know. I mean, the world is your oyster here with the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> what do you want to do with it? I think they could use some O-line reinforcements. I really like the Kenyon Green pick. I'm going to stick with the interior of the offensive line. I'm going to take Zion Johnson, the offensive guard, out of Boston College. This is a guy who is riding the pre-draft month and the pre-draft process, the senior bowl buzz, the combine buzz, I think right into the 20s at some point in the sweet spot in round one for him. The size and frame are good. Uh, He's a guy who... You know, he's got great strength, great power. I think he's a guy who showed even a little bit more athleticism at the combine than I think people thought. And he looked really fluid in the on-field drills. This is a guy who instant plug-and-play starter. You know, you can do a lot of different things with him. I think he's best in a power gap run scheme. But I think he showed that he has the ability uh, to move maybe better in space than I think people gave him credit for. So you can do a lot of different things with him. I think he's an instant starter. Lock him in and not worry about him on the O-line. There you have it. All right, number 29 here, the Miami Dolphins on the clock. Andrew Erickson, where are they going? We got a late offensive line run here. So I'm going to go with Bernard Raymond from Central Michigan, offensive tackle. I mean, the the offensive line for Miami was is abysmal last year. Just Not absolutely good. terrible. Not you know, good. The, the graded out as the, the worst pass blocking unit for PFF in 2021. So again, similar to, you know, with Daniel Jones, it's like if we're going to evaluate Tua, in some capacity, we got to get him some solid offensive line. And that's something that Mike McDaniel obviously knows a lot about. San Francisco had one of the best offensive lines. And when they were operating at full capacity, you saw Jimmy Garoppolo be able to be efficient and be an efficient passer. So I like the six foot seven tackle uh, from Central Michigan. All right, Derek Brown, you are up next for the Kansas City Chiefs. Pick number 30 could go in the secondary here, could go in the line. Where are your thoughts? I'm going to go with the secondary. Tyron Matthew is a free agent, and I think that they need to address the back end. Uh, I wish uh, one of these wide receivers could have fallen here. I think if John Dotson would have ran faster at the combine, we could maybe see him sneak in here. But I'm going to go with Daxton Hill. I think they need to address the safety position, um, although they do have other needs. Uh, Kansas City has made it a penchant. Like They're willing to sit here and piece together their defensive line, their cornerbacks at times. All of those are need spots, but give me Daxton Hill. What a fun IDP draft this is. I'm enjoying this. I hope everybody <laughs> out there listening is too. Cincinnati Bengals, almost champions, just fell one game short, one play short even, you could argue. Up next at number 31, uh, I mean, I think we all know what they need, Paul. The question <laughs> is, is there the right guy to fit that role on the offensive line left? Yeah, I think there's one guy left that warrants going in round one, and that's Tyler Smith, the offensive tackle out of Tulsa. Great size and frame, good athleticism. He's got quickness. He's got movement skills. He's got good play strength, power, and toughness. He's got really good length. He's got the ability to recover if he gets beat. I think he's a starting offensive tackle. He has some versatility that he could also play guard if they needed him to, and he can play in either run scheme. I think he's a guy that even from a smaller level school like Tulsa, he can come in uh and, and immediately be plugged in either at tackle or at guard whatever they need to try to upgrade that offensive line in front in front of joe burrow to try to give him a fighting chance back there and maybe get back to the super bowl next year and it was tyler smith from tulsa right that was the pick yep tyler smith tyler smith from tulsa okay you got the offensive lineman there and that brings us to the last pick of the first round it's the Detroit Lions because the Rams don't like drafting. They don't like it. They, they're they so over making picks. So the Lions are going to close things out here, almost bookending this draft. So Andrew Erickson, take us home at 32. Yep. So we've been avoiding it the entire time. These, these quarterbacks, we just don't want them. Um, but the Lions here, I think that it makes sense for them to take a shot on one of the quarterbacks, especially even though they pick at 34, um, get the fifth year option, you know, with one of these signal cars, you know, things work out. It makes sense for them to take him at 32 and suppose of waiting to the second round. So Kenny Pickett and your small hands, welcome to Motown. <laughs> That's right. Let's go, <laughs> Kenny Pickett. Don't listen to them. If you can throw the football, you can throw the football. I mean, just because our quarterback here at Fantasy Pros, Chris, has enormous giant man hands doesn't mean that Kenny Pickett can't be a successful quarterback too. And now the podcast has come full circle. I'm going to recap these last few picks here. We started with 
The New England Patriots at 21. Nicobe Dean, linebacker from Georgia. Great pick there. Love that. Uh, Las Vegas Raiders at 22. Chris Olave, wide receiver from Ohio State. Then Jordan Davis goes to the Arizona Cardinals, defensive tackle from Georgia. Then Dallas Cowboys at 24. Select Jermaine Johnson, edge rusher from Florida State. The Buffalo Bill, excuse me, the um, – Yep, Jordan Johnson, <laughs> Florida State. I got ahead of myself there. The Buffalo Bills at 25, Devin Lloyd, linebacker from Utah. The Tennessee Titans, Christian Watson, wide receiver from North Dakota State. And then Kenyon Green, the guard from Texas A&M, goes at number 27 to the Buccaneers. At 28, the Green Bay Packers take Zion Johnson, guard from Boston College. Then we've got uh, Bernard Raymond, offensive tackle from Central Michigan, going to the Miami Dolphins. The Kansas City Chiefs taking Daxon Hill, safety from Michigan. The Cincinnati Bengals get their offensive lineman from Tulsa, Tyler Smith. And finally, big hand, Kenny Pickett. I'm going to call him big hands, Kenny Pickett from now on. Goes to the Detroit Lions to close out the first round. The quarterback from Pittsburgh. So, again... A lot of defensive players. Paul, when you sit back and look how this first round went, we certainly have a lot of quarterbacks remaining. We got Howell, Ritter, Corral. Obviously, the second round is going to be interesting when we get to that coming up in the weeks ahead when we do that here on the show. But what's your biggest takeaway from this first round besides the fact it's a pretty heavy defensive and offensive lineman draft? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the wide receivers are going to go. We're going to see that. I don't think we're going to see a tight end. I don't think we're going to see a running back. I mean, maybe Brees Hall kind of pops in there. And I think the quarterbacks are, are going to fall a little bit, especially with Washington making their trade today. And, you know, if Seattle doesn't take a quarterback at nine and wants to go the veteran route, you know, it's hard to kind of peg landing spots for these guys. So I think the quarterbacks fall and only two going, you know, I, I think isn't that much of a surprise. And, you know, I think, you know, can Corral sneak in there? But right now I think Corral's probably taking it for round two. And I would say the one thing that I think surprised me the most, and I think I lost sight of him a couple of times when I was on the clock, is I do think Jermaine Johnson is is going to go significantly higher, like top 10, top 12. Okay. Uh, you know, if, if that I can't. happens, Paul, right? Every year there's a guy we think is going to go top 10, and we go, oh, can't believe that happens. So yeah. that's not all that out of the ordinary, I guess. Yeah, I mean, he's another guy kind of like Zion Johnson who's riding that momentum. Great senior bowl, great combine, and really seems to be getting a lot of buzz. So we'll see if he goes ahead of guys like Karloftis and Ajabo. I think that's where it's going, but we'll see if that happens. All right, so obviously with all the linemen going, just out of curiosity, the offensive linemen, let's say they all go. If Miami's sitting there, Andrew Erickson, with that pick, if you had to do it again and Brees Hall was out there and you didn't have any offensive linemen that graded out his first round, do you think that would be the landing spot for Miami? Because they could certainly stand to lock down one running back that's good <laughs> in that town, don't you think? I don't. I don't know if, if draft Twitter can handle a running back going in the first round. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like from a fantasy perspective, I would absolutely love now it. Now I want like, it even more. Let's that's go, like first round running backs. But I mean, like whenever I do mock drafts, I just like can't like. I can't like live with myself drafting a running back in the first round, like let alone in the second round. I'm like, Oh my God, like this is such a waste of a pick. Like you could just get so many guys, so much better value. So I really hope not. I, I, feel, I hope that we've come to the point where teams are smart enough to realize like, it's just, I mean, like Jonathan Taylor wasn't even a first round pick. Like, like that's mm -hmm. the thing, the best running back stand like all these best running backs are just never first round picks. The just value is not there. So I, I highly doubt that they would, I, I think, especially with Mike McDaniel coming in, like, their best running back last year was Elijah Mitchell, who they got in the sixth round. So I think that mm -hmm. they'll be smart and they'll realize that they still need, you know, the protection, you know, first and foremost. Uh, Derek Brown, you and I both know you, everybody had a lot of discipline today, made really good picks. That's not always the case in real life. Do you think that some of these quarterbacks as the weeks drag on here, start to get some more buzz and some more hype and then the pro days and a couple other things happen. And next thing you know, a couple more quarterbacks sneak in the first round. Cause I kind of feel like that's going to happen. Oh, I think it's going to happen. Uh, I think if you're looking at how many quarterbacks, I think that there's there's probably two guys that are going to go in the first round. I think Malik and I think Kenny Pickett are going to go in the first round. I think a third one is probably going to sneak in there. Now, whether that's Corral or you want to make a, a conversation for Desmond Ritter after the combine or even Sam Howell, I think that we're going to see a third quarterback probably get selected in the first round just because of the position, because of teams. I think that you know, all of these veteran quarterbacks we're talking about moving around, like teams are going to have to sell themselves on like, okay, um, what's the opportunity cost and the trade cost for somebody like Jimmy Garoppolo versus moving up in the NFL draft to try to get into the back end of the first round? I think that weighing those different factors could shift the balance on how many quarterbacks we see, but I do think there's probably three guys that are going to make it in there. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's probably going to be what happens too. Plus, it's a quarterback driven league and people want to take some shots. And last year was a prolific year for quarterbacks. It's not quite the same, but who knows? You know, sometimes on paper, these things don't look so good. And we look back and we go, wow, that turned out to be a really good quarterback class. And sometimes the inverse happens. But uh, uh, we'll see what draft Twitter thinks of this episode after all. I'm old that. enough to remember that Achilles Smith and EJ Manuel were first round picks. Um, <laughs> so if they can make it into the first round, <laughs> Sam Howell and Matt Corral, I mean, they, they could get there. They can get there. Howell and Corral. There we go. We'll see what happens with that. Uh uh, this was a great show, guys. This was so much fun to do. I hope everybody who's listening enjoyed it. Uh, Paul Pertichese, uh, you can follow him on the Twitter machine at paulie 23 ny and check out all of his work with Saturday to SundayFootball.com. It was tremendous having you on as a guest. We're all smarter for having you here, Paul. Thanks so much for giving us the time today. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun talking this mock draft with you guys, talking prospects and joking around with you guys. Great times. All right, and I hope all the rest of our Fantasy Pros family is now happy that they've gotten their <laughs> pop on air from their performance in the football game. We can finally put that to bed. Uh, if not, maybe they should enter the NFL draft, and we'll see where they would go. Uh, obviously, our video producer, Chris, would probably go 1-1. We all know that. Massive hands as a quarterback. Just massive hands. There you go. Uh, that'll do it for us. So before we go, I want to remind everybody, make sure you're following us on all of our social media platforms at Fantasy Pros, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, we do it all. And of course, our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash fantasy pros, where we have the most amazing content like all the podcasts. We've got these videos, we got emergency shows, we got crazy things happening. The NFL never stops, and neither do we. And also at fantasypros.com, we have amazing rookie content going on. We're going to have like, I don't know, I feel like every guy that we know here who works here, Derek Brown, Andrew Erickson, Scott Bogman, they're all going to have rookie mock draft articles coming out in the weeks ahead so make sure you're looking for those too because man we are excited about this time of year it's a fresh new season and we are ready for it i'm here for it so there you have it that'll do it for us but the story of the game goes on for Derek brown for paul for easy e andrew erickson and me joey p we'll see you next time kids thanks for tuning in to the fantasy pros youtube channel don't forget to check out our featured videos and while you're at it, make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Fantasy Pros so you can get the latest news and updates to give you the edge you need in your fantasy league.